Chris is from Uni Tech and I'm just going to leave you to yourself to introduce yourself. Great, Chris. thank you. Uh, so my name is uh, William, I go by Chris Headley. Uh, I actually graduated with my PhD uh, in electrical engineering in May and now I work with the Hume Center at Virginia Tech. Sorry a little bit, as you mentioned, for the shuffling, we had a little bit of family emergency we need to get on the road, so we kind of moved the up. So if this is a little raw, I'm going to have a little bunch to look at the slides, so we're going to see what we can do here. But the main goal of this talk is going to be a little bit different than some of the other talks you heard. The point is of this presentation to say, as a PhD student, uh, GNU Radio was very fundamental in my graduation. So I, what I wanted to do was present a little bit of theory and say, hey, I went from theory to simulation in GNU Radio to using USRPs and taking it over the air and saying, hey, this theory actually works. So I'm going to kind of go through the process with you guys today. And it's going to be on doing statistical signal parameter estimation and modulation classification in your radio. Or another title I'd like to give to is Dr. Headley or How I Learned to Stop Relying on Theory and Love in your Radio. So that's exactly what I'm going to do today. So a little bit of the presentation outline. So why did I look at this topic and uh, why did I uh, use your radio? Then I'm going to talk about an asynchronous moment-based timing and SNR estimation approach. Uh, using moments, uh, and a feature-based modulation classifier using the kurtosis that builds upon those estimators, and then I'm going to uh, end with some questions that you guys can uh, grow me on. Okay, so first, uh, why spectrum sensing? Uh, well, spectrum sensing, let me give you a brief idea of what I mean by spectrum sensing, maybe it differs in the room here, but basically it's any signal processing task that involves detecting if a signal exists in spectrum, estimating the parameters of that signal that you just detected, and then perhaps identifying the signaling format of that signal. So all three of those things, algorithms that do any or all of those things, can be thought of as spectrum sensing tasks. And on the side here, I just had a uh, nice little cyclic spectrum of DPSK signal. And actually from that spectrum, you can actually get an idea of the uh, baud rate of the BPSK signal, and even if it is a BPSK signal in fact. So this is just one way in which you can do uh, spectrum sensing. So why is spectrum sensing important? Uh, it has a lot of applications, I'm sure you've heard of all before. Opportunistic spectrum sharing, uh, military scenarios, jamming, anti-jamming. It's very important to know where the signal is and what the signal is. And it's even important for actually eavesdropping and actually getting the data out. So all, this is critically important in many different areas, commercially and militarily. So uh, what is the problem, though? What, what makes it hard for us researchers to do spectrum sensing? Well, not only inherently do you not know perhaps <laughs> everything about the signal of interest, but you know, may not know the propagation channel a priori, or what your capabilities of your hardware are, or the transmitter's hardware, or even the software capabilities of both. So all of these things can muddy up the waters here, and you'll see some of that uh, during my presentation. So why do it radio? Well, the short answer is because my committee told me to, and actually one of them's back there and the other one's back there. But outside of that, I'm just kidding. Uh, but seriously, it is a great tool for somebody like me who transitioned from the world of theory to from MATLAB simulations to the real world, as I like to say, you know, closer to the real world. So it's a natural pro progression for me from math so that lab simulation to GNU radio block creation and then over the air testing with USRPs. So this is kind of my love letter to you guys. Thank you very much for getting me a degree. So now let's talk about a little bit of math. As I say there, I'm sorry, but really I'm not sorry. You guys have just had to run there. So let's talk about the received model that I'm interested in. I'm considering linear digital amplitude phase modulation schemes, LDAPM for short. Any P PAM, PSK QAM, or any other thing that can be where the symbols can be put on an IQ constellation plot. Uh, it can be shown by this uh, equation here where we have some symbols, SK, and here, anywhere we see it in blue, hopefully you guys can see that. Uh, anything in blue is what I'm considering to be unknown. Anything that's black, I'm considering to be known. Uh, you can see that we have some symbols with a pulse shape on it, which I'm assuming to be a root raised cosine pulse which is the equation that you have, the second equation there, that has its roll-off factor, symbol interval, you can see all that there, I won't spend too much time. But, the received signal, assuming an AWGN channel for the purposes of this, is can be seen here, where now we have some channel gain multiplied onto it, we have some phase shift, uh, some constant phase shift, and some constant 
delay due to the propagation time of the channel. Okay? So given that receiving signal model, well, how can we rewrite that delay? Well, we can think of a delay as a function of symbols. So a number of integer symbols were delayed, and we're, we're assuming here a constant delay for the purposes of the simulation. So we're going to consider there were some integer number of symbols delayed, and then some fraction of a symbol delay. And what's important in modulation classification in particular is that we don't care how many integer symbols we off. We don't care about the actual data underneath, but we do want to be symbol aligned in order to avoid intersymbolar interference from our root base cosine function. So what, we're gonna, what we can say is that our delay due to the channel and due to the fact that the transmitter and receiver inherently will not be time synchronous, we can represent that by two values, L plus F epsilon, where L is the number of integers delayed and epsilon is the fraction of a symbol delay. So what we're going to focus on is that epsilon value. And then of course we have some AWGN noise process that's added on to it. So you can see our unknowns are piling up that we need to deal with these things. So there's some logical constraints in spectrum sensing. Uh, the timing parameters are not unknown a priori for a couple of reasons. Uh, we may not have a, a cooperative transmitter, and we may have an unknown channel. Typical problems that you may run into in spectrum sensing. So let's say that we want to still, we want just like before, we want to downmix, match filter, and sample, just like we would if we were synchronized. Well, if we do that and we don't know the fractional time delay, what do we get? And what we get is this equation here, where you can see that instead of just having the symbol plus some additive white Gaussian noise, we actually have our symbols with a uh, phase and gain to them due to the channel, and we also have this uh, summation, which goes from negative, negative infinity to infinity, which is our intersymbolic interference due to our root base cosine. We're not sampling at the optimal points, so now we have corrupted signals. Okay? So what does that look like? Well, I've gone from the math. Let's look at a little bit of the MATLAB simulation. This is what I came up with. Uh, just doing that lab. So you see that we have a QPSK modulated symbol here, and at the way top, we have perfectly time synchronized. So you get your symbols, perfect symbols as you normally see. But we see as we add a fractional time delay, as you go down the plot, you get intersymbolic interference. I'm sure most of you have seen something like this before. And then you can see that on the left and on the right, we have different roll-off factors of our root base cosine. And as we know, as our roll-off factor decreases, our intersymbol interference increases, which you can see in that plot. So everything still makes sense. So I said to myself, okay, let's put this in video and make sure they know what they're doing. So let's see. So what I did was I built all this up in video radio. And you can see here, I don't know if y'all can see that actually. Wow. Let's see if I can move that over. Okay, so now we talked about the impact of timing offset in the radio. Let's look at some prior work. 
So there is something called the M2, M4 uh, SMR estimator, which uses the second and fourth order moment in order to estimate the SMR of PSK and QAM signals. So, but the key here is that it anticipates that you're synchronized. So given the received symbol, so now we have our symbol with some gain on it, some phase shift, and then plus noise, we can see we can do the math here, take the second and fourth order absolute moments of these received symbols, and what we come up with is the following results for the amplitude and the noise variance, which we take one or the other, we can get ourselves a function of the SNR. But the problem again is we're limited. We assume we must assume time synchronization, and it requires knowledge of the modulation format, because in these values we must know what the fourth absolute moment of the symbols are. So we must know something about the symbols themselves. So this, this won't work for us. Can we do a little bit better? And in fact, this block you can actually uh, is in GNU Radio. And if we go over here, let's see if that's easy again. Oh gosh. So if we go over here and we look at, let's take the sample delay back off and put some noise on there. Okay, fine. If I go to the terminal, which I'm printing out, don't know if you can see that, but right now it's saying we've got about 8 dB SNR. However, if I go and add some sample delay to this, quickly what we see is that this falls apart. Now it says we're at 1 dB. But in fact, that's actually SINR, not SNR, so this is kind of falling apart on us. What we need to do is find a different way. Can we measure the SNR while we're time asynchronous? So let's continue on here. So what I did was I come up with an asynchronous method of moments based estimation approach in order to estimate the amplitude, the noise variance, and the fractional time delay. And what I said was, let's take that M2 and 4 estimator, let's get rid of the, uh, the fourth absolute moment, which requires knowledge of the symbols in the modulation format, and let's just use three time delayed versions of the second absolute moment, which you can see here. And doing the math, what you come up with is you must understand the impacts of the root base cosine pulse on the actual uh, asynchronous uh, moments here. So what you can see is that this bottom equation is actually the uh, infinite summation of the root base cosine pulse, which we can plug back to that equation and have a nice close form expression. So if we take three of those moments at three different time delays, which I'm assuming that I know how far apart I'm sampling at the receiver, what I can come up with is three equations, each a function of the alpha, the sigma, and the uh, fractional time delay, and I can solve those together in order to come up with equations for everything, and also come up with an SNR estimate. And you can see these equations above. So, what's the algorithm that I want to put into GNU Radio in order to test it? Well, first we need to find the three absolute moments of interest, and there's the equation there again. We want to find the three possible values for epsilon from my equation, because you're going to have some ambiguity on what those estimates are. But then what you're going to do is you're going to plug those fractional time delay estimates into the value for alpha, which is going to tell you that one of the fractional values is wrong. And you can ignore it, and it's going to give you one value for the epsilon and two values for the alpha. And we plug that all into the sigma, and everything comes out in the wash, and I have one equation for the fractional time delay, the alpha, and the sigma. Okay? So, and of course, as we all know, the practice is the moments will not be known a priori unless you must estimate them. And there's the estimator there, and that's actually what I do in uh, GNU Radio. So what I want to do is quickly move over there. So again, what we have now, let me reduce the noise here, is we have some symbols with noise on it. And if I go over to the other tab, what you see is that down here we have estimates going across for the gain, the noise variance, and the fractional time delay, and the SNR. So the key here is, is if I go back to what we had before, I put a little bit of noise on it, and we see that what we have here is that the SNR is about 2 dB according to the M2 and 4 estimator. Now, if I go over to my estimator, using this approach, we're getting about 11 dB, and you can actually see this is I'm using the estimate of the fractional time delay in order to correct the symbol. You see now I'm back to my nice points separated from each other and not have fractional time delay put on them. So, again, everything seems to be working. Uh, so, let's continue on. We've done the estimation. 
Let's go into a little bit of classification. Oh, actually, let's look at some MATLAB simulation results just to further prove the point. And what you can see is from these estimators is that typical, as the SMR increases, our estimate performance increases as can be expected. Uh, same thing with if we use more symbols in order to do our estimation, our performance increases. You can see that from these plots. And also, the estimator's performance is a function of the roll-off factor. This again comes back to the fact that lower roll-off factors have more intersimilar interference, which corrupts our signals and makes our estimates harder to do. So, and then same thing with uh, what I wanted to do is also compare against the M2M4 estimator, which you kind of just saw. And the, the curve right there is the M2M4 estimator's performance as the fractional time delay gets worse. Now, what you see there right into the hump is because you're going from one symbol over to the next symbol, which is why you're going from a fractional delay of zero to a fractional delay of one. So the M2M4 estimator's performance is better when you actually are synchronized, but as you can see that when, as the delay increases, my estimator, which has a flat performance no matter what the fractional time delay is, actually improves is improved upon from the input form. Okay. And of course, I just showed you uh, the, the new radio results just a minute ago. And I just wanted to say that thanks to GR Mod Tool, because it's a, actually a very good tool in order to get this, it actually let me just focus on the algorithm. So again, uh, these tools are actually very useful. So we talked about asynchronous moment-based timing and SNR estimation. How can we wrap those estimators into some modulation classification? Well, we can use something that's known as the kurtosis. Uh, and I don't know if I'm doing this right, but I know that Tim likes the doge meme, so hopefully that's kind of in the right area. Sorry, I'm, I'm not hit to the dot here. So, so what is what is kurtosis? Well, kurtosis is the measure of the peakness of a probability distribution. You didn't know you were going to hear this much sarcastic and stuff today, I'm sure. Uh, typically, re with respect to the standard normal distribution. So, what is the equation? Well, well, for complex random variables, there's no one official definition of kurtosis. But for this work, we're going to use this definition. Okay? Uh, now, the key here, and what the key to the estimators that I did before, I don't know if I've mentioned this, is that they're immune to phase effects. Because I'm using the second and fourth absolute moments, so the phase goes out of the wash. Same thing for the kurtosis. There's no phase information there. It's all absolute moments. So we can do this, and when the key to this is we can do it even if we have some frequency offset. Even if we're spinning, we can still use the estimator that I just came up with, and we can also do this moment-based uh, kurtosis estimation. So let's look at the modulation kurtosis. And what I mean by the modulation kurtosis is what's the kurtosis of the actual PSK, QAM, or whatever you can think of symbols? Well, what we say is that our random variable is above, where we have some real component and some imaginary component of our symbols. We plug that into the kurtosis equation, and we work out all the math. And what we get is the uh, kurtosis mod is at the bottom here, which is a function of a bunch of fourth and second absolute moments. Oh, excuse me, regular moments of the real and the imaginary components of the symbols. Okay? So what does that mean? Well, what that means is, is that we've got something that we can take that's just a function of simple moments, a very fairly easy calculation. And if we do that on the symbols, we can see that for BPSK and QPSK, they're different. Ah, so if we can get these values, then we can determine the difference between modulation schemes. I can figure out what <coughs> modulation scheme is being done. Uh, however, and this is an important part, is that kurtosis cannot be used to tell you the order of PSK. And I don't know if I should shout this out to the route, but can anybody tell me why you can't determine the order of PSK modulus schemes using kurtosis? I don't know if I heard it, but the actual answer is there's, you, there's no phase information. I just mentioned before that phase information is removed in kurtosis in my estimators. So while uh, we can tell the difference between PSK and QPSK, and we can definitely tell the difference between the qualms, as you see here, with the n value, which is actually a function of the order, we can actually tell the difference between the order of qualm, the order of PAM, and the difference between BPSK and QPSK. So that's good. But however, that's just the symbols. What happens to the symbols when we go through an actual channel in which we have amplitude, noise variance, and fractional time delay? Well, I'm going to show you. So as before, we say that the received symbols are defined as above here. 
And now we take that received symbol that I just showed you, and we put it into the kurtosis equation, we do all math, and we come up with this equation at the bottom. Looks innocuous enough, right? We've just got something that's our KR, which is our received kurtosis, which is equal to, on the right there, K mod, which is that modulation kurtosis, that's the part that's actually a function of the modulation scheme, and then the other part is a function of the channel. We've got our amplitude there, which is our alpha. We've got our noise variance, which is the sigma. And we've got these two functions, and I'm always part of Greek, I'm pretty sure that's phi. Uh, phi, which is a function of the fractional time delay. Now, the key here is what are those phi values? Well, using something called the Poisson summation formula, we can take something that is infinite summation in time and turn it into something that's infinite summation in frequency. And what the key to that is, is we know that the root raised cosine goes forever, and the, rate, and the raised cosine, they go forever in time, but they don't go forever in frequency. So if we can convert this over to frequency, we now don't have to do an infinite summation. We just have to do a summation through the actual uh, band of the actual full shape. So what can we do if we do the math on that? We have that the phi to the two, which is our, like, basically our second order phi, is what we needed before, this equation you saw before, for the moment based estimator. And then here is, it's actually a piecewise function as a function of the roll off factor for the phi to the fourth power. Basically, what you're doing to get these values is you're taking the uh, correlation of the root base cosine uh, twice in order to do that. And that's not really fun to do. But anyway, in order to graduate, I needed to do it, so I did. And for <laughs> less than 0.5, this is what it is. Okay, there's a lot of stuff there, but unfortunately this is what it is when uh, alpha, uh, the roll-off factor is greater than 0.5. Yeah, that took a while to figure out. Uh, but anyway, that is actually the true solution uh, for the moments given the root base cosine pulse change. So what can we do with that? Well, we can do estimates of the modulation kurtosis from that. Now we fully define the whole problem. If we can estimate alpha, we can estimate the sigma, and we can estimate the fractional time delay, and we have estimates of the received kurtosis, then we can do the equation backwards and come up with an estimate for k mod, which is going to allow us to do our modulation classification. So what's great is we already have estimators for all of these things. So let's do it, plug them in there, and see what the result is. So first off, let's look at a little bit of, at some math out here. And what we see is, is that on the left, yeah, on the left, for QPSK modulated signal, and I actually did like a slowly varying radio fading channel, uh, just to be fancy. Uh, but uh, you can see that the same thing uh, before is the kurtosis estimation is a function of the SMR. The performance improves as a function of SMR because the noise variance decreases. Uh, it's a function of the number of symbols that I look at. So performance is better the more symbols you look at. Seems fairly obvious. And again, the performance is also a function of the roll-off factor. Higher roll-off factors give better performance. Uh, also, we wanted to look at what's the kurtosis estimation for the modulation schemes, because that's important to us. And we see that the PSKs perform uh, this, uh, the best, and they also all perform the same, which again is because they all look the same. There's no phase information in the kurtosis, so their performance should all line up, and that's the, mo the bottom most plot. Uh, then what we see is that Quam is the next better performing. You can see that there where the higher orders perform worse than the lower orders. That's kind of the middle two plots. And then finally at the top we have the PAMs. You may ask yourself, well typically PAMs perform better than QAMs in most situations. Why are they reversed here and the QAMs are performing better? Well it turns out that actually the fourth order moment is it, a lot more variance for PAM modulation schemes because you're increasing the order much quicker. Uh, you're increasing the amplitude differences much quicker. So that actually causes you more problems. So we talked about some MATLAB. Uh, let's talk about some more MATLAB. I'm forgetting my slides here. So, okay, yeah. So I'm going to listen up, don't worry. So anyway, so here's some performance of actually doing some modulation classification. And you can see that uh, same thing as we up the number of symbols, our modulation classification performance improves as expected. So really quickly, let's go over the, over the air. I know I'm doing simulation live for you guys, but during, actually, I was brave. During my defense, I actually did a live demo with USRPs. Uh, these are two uh, N210 USRP, or B210 USRP, excuse me. And what you can see is, is that I have the transmitter USRP there. Uh, and you can see the flow graph, you saw it before. And then what you can see there is the received, uh, received chain there. Uh, you can see the block diagram, it's kind of like the math and everything. And there's the USRP in the flow graph. 
And that's the whole picture. And what we determined, and what I showed in my dissertation, was that the simulation lines up very nicely with the over-the-air results for a nice uh, for an AWGN channel. And you can see that for each of the uh, lines there, the solid line and the dashed line, dashed line being over-the-air experimentation, line up. Okay. So. Really quickly, let's go over and look at the simulation one more time. And what we can see is, is that if we go over to where we have our corrupted signal, uh, we can go back to the symbols, and you, I don't know if you guys can read this, but we have what the true modulation kurtosis is, which for QPSK is negative one. And then we have what the raw kurtosis is. So due to the channel, the kurtosis is all wrong. There's channel effects there. So we can't use the raw kurtosis for modulation classification. You can see that using the algorithm I just defined, this value over here, it says estimated modulation kurtosis, is now back to negative, near negative one. So now, after correcting for the channel, we can do modulation classification in, again, even in this channel environment. So, and just to uh, show you, I just want to prove one aspect here, is that this can work for any type of modulation scheme. We are using one that you guys might be familiar with. Called VT modulation scheme, which is a big 64 symbol modulation scheme that we can add sample delay to and some noise variance. And then we go back over here and we can still correct it. So the key here is that it works for anything that can be on an IQ plot. This is not just PAM, PSK, plot, whatever you can think of. Okay? And thank you very much. Um, so there's a lot of material there, so sorry, it was a little quick. Uh, I hope it's time for questions. Maybe one. <laughs> Maybe one. Maybe one. <laughs> um, so, great talk. Um, for you. the classification, do they need to be synchronized? To no. Results? No, so what I do is I actually just take that uh, kurtosis question, or uh, some question, kurtosis estimate, and then I just use that, and I say, what I did for the plot that you saw was just whichever one I'm closest to, the true kurtosis I'm closest to, I call that the modulation classification. You can do something more elegant if you want to. Actually, is Tim here? Can he please come and set up his stuff? Yeah. Yeah, one more question. Well, yes, of course. So, another question would be, uh, yeah. if you work on, uh, I want to uh, yeah. try to to classify like APSK is kind of tough uh, because you need much higher cumulants. Yes. And then, you know, noise is a big issue. So, did you work on this? So, actually, I didn't work on higher order cumulants, but we do have a student at the Hume Center. He's actually here and who does work on a lot of the higher order cumulants stuff. And I think there's a poster right around this wall that talks about his work in that area. And he's just, yeah, no. It's not that. Oh, okay. The poster's not that, but you do do that. Yes. That's actually the guy that's talking to appear actually interested in that. Thanks, Bill Clark. But he works on that. So there's this guy, Carlson, who worked on high order ones. I think quite successfully, but not with a live demo in his PhD defense, which I think is pretty bold here. And then deserve the next round of applause. So I'm talking about that. I do want to thank